Our next speaker uh, is coming from uh, Chisinau. Uh, he's a very good friend of mine. Uh, he's a Fafa alumni. So uh, please, warm welcome to Andrei Lisnik. Hi everyone, just give me a minute to set my laptop, if not, we'll have a live demo session. <laughs> okay, well, while my laptop puts up, I have a, I have a question for the audience. Uh, who here thinks that the world, the world needs another programming language? Please raise your hand. <laughs> that's, I, I, that's actually what I expected, so... Uh, and for that, I have a small story of mine to share. So, uh, about three or four years ago, um, I went to see the sources of Sinatra Web, uh, Web uh, Framework, if you know about that. And uh, I saw that all the code in Sinatra is in one file. It's about 2,000 lines of code with a lot of nested classes. And I said, okay, uh, this seems not optimal and I can fix it. So I made a pull request to Sinatra, splitting all those, all that big file in a lot of small files, thinking that uh, I will uh, make the world a better place. Uh, to my surprise, that pull request was rejected, and the maintainer said, thank you, thank you, man, but actually we're okay with that. So um, I was frustrated and thinking, uh, like, why is this happening? And, uh, and I thought I could do better, and I said, I'm gonna write, I don't need that. <laughs> I'm, I'm, gonna, I don't, I'm gonna write my own a small web framework which will be 10 times better and everybody will use it uh, and I did just that and it's called New York New York and nobody uses it so um, but still I don't regret that, that experience because to write that small web framework I had to learn a lot of stuff and even though my New York New York is sitting on my github account uh, actually doing nothing but it changed me as a person because I, I learned a lot in this journey. So I hope with this talk I will encourage you to create things, not for every, not to, for hypes, for stars, uh, for sports and shit, but for yourself in the first place. And we'll do that uh, by writing a small programming language. So uh, my name is uh, Andre. Uh, I'm at Stuart Saltage, and yes, we'll try to write a small programming language. So, uh, what is a programming language? Let's try to, to move in simple steps and maybe understand what we should, should do. So, first of all, a programming language is a, is a set of rules which uh, is called syntax. What does mean? That, that means that if you take, for example, Ruby and try to execute a, what is not a valid Ruby program, for example, we don't close the quotes and parentheses, we'll get an error because Ruby has rules with related how a valid Ruby program should look. And if you fix that stuff, and it works because the second part is actually a valid Ruby program. So that's fine. Okay, to write a programming language, we have to define the rules for this programming language and somehow enforce them and have some a way to say for any input whether that's a valid or not valid program. But what do we do next? And as usual, we, for answers, we turn to Mother Nature. And the answer for that is trees. Uh, let me explain, but not, not just any tree. We need actually an abstract syntax tree. And if you like definitions from Wikipedia, well, I don't, so we'll make an example. <laughs> so uh, there's a, there's a uh, gem in a Ruby called Parser which allows you to take any Ruby code and generate an abstract syntax tree from that. And now, for this purpose, I took a very simple program in Ruby, which just adds and multiplies numbers. And it spits some output, but if you visualize it, you'll understand what I mean. So, the result of that uh, program is a tree. Is a tree meaning that it, it follows a uh, hierarchical nested structure. And why trees are useful? Because we can take the very complex task of evaluating a program and split it in very small steps. So Ruby, uh, to understand that, 
uh, we'll try to execute this program by just looking at the tree and not looking at the code. Because the code itself is simple, but we must understand the principles on which the program evaluation is built. So we have at the top the addition, and in Ruby is an object-oriented object -oriented program. So uh, when we uh, do a method, when we do addition, actually it's a method on integer. So Ruby, we need to evaluate this at the top, but to invoke uh, a method in Ruby, we must first evaluate the receiver of that method, which in our case is integer one. So we go there, and in our program, it's very simple to evaluate a one, evaluate, a one is just a one. So we know who receives the message plus, we then need to evaluate what are the arguments of this addition. And again, we use the same principle, we need to evaluate the receiver, and what, what's interesting here that we apply the same principles at the top to evaluate the, the bottom part of the tree. And again, we evaluate the receiver one, and to execute a method, we need also to evaluate the argument, and to evaluate three, it's just a three. Now we have all the parts that we need, we can evaluate the multiplication, which will result in three, and when we have again all the parts that we need, we can evaluate the addition, which will result in four. So you can see that by taking our code and representing as a representing as a tree, we can execute it in very small, very small steps. And after each of that step, the problem becomes smaller and simple, smaller and simple. So, so okay. So we know we, we have to have rules, right? We we need to build an abstract tree and then we evaluate it. That 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 these are our, our steps for uh, writing a programming language. So uh, let's write a programming language. Okay. So for that I chose uh, we'll implement code to execute this very simple program on my screen. What it does is outputs. Please input your name to the screen gets your names uh, and sends it to a variable and outputs hello, for example, Andre. And why I chose the Lisp syntax? Because it's very simple, because in, in Lisp, everything starts with a parenthesis and everything ends with a parenthesis. And you will see later why, why that is convenient. So let's focus on the first step, define the rules. So for that, uh, there are libraries which can help us with that. They're called parsing expression grammars. Uh, again, uh, Wikipedia definitions, you'll see in the code why is that uh, helpful. So let's go. Uh, since I restarted my computer, I'll have to start everything up again. Okay. Is that font size okay? Okay, so Ruby, uh, there, there's a gem for, called Parslet in Ruby, which allows us to define rules for how should syntax should look in a programming language. And I chose it because uh, it, it doesn't have a special like files or something like that, it's just simple Ruby code. So in here we have our program. Again, our goal is to have something which will tell us is this a valid program or not? And that's it. So we simplified our task uh, for uh, for us to move forward faster. So now, par uh, par parcel gem uh, has a lot of special syntax. I will not uh, stop in very much detail at uh, each of these steps. But again, it, it's a gem which has documentation as an example. You can study it in your free time because, unfortunately, in this talk. Uh, it, it's a lot of uh, information to explain, so I'll just try to do my best to, to guide you through the definition. So, at the root we have a program which makes sense. If we tell it uh, to parcel a gem, what's, what's the top of that tree which we, we saw in the previous example. And then, since we said that at the root we have a program, we have to define what the program is. So, again, a program. It's just a bunch of expressions. Uh, that is the parcel uh, um, DSL for expressing that. 
Why is this a bunch of expression? Because we, our problem has one expression, two expression, and three expression. That makes sense. So, but for that, we need to define what an expression is. So, an expression in our very simple programming language is some optional space followed by open parentheses here, right? Followed by body here, ending with a parenthesis, and followed by an optional space. Again, this is uh, we we say how our code should look, and we have to define a bunch of stuff which just mentioned. So next up, we define well, what's a body. Uh, so a body in our programming language is either an expression, because in here we have an expression, inside we have either an identifier or we have in expressions other expressions. And we also can have inside the strings. So we've just enumerated what, what types of stuff our program is composed of. And again we have to define what's a identifier and what's a string. Let's go further. An identifier in our simple programming language is just anything lowercase and also plus with at least one character. Lowercase, 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 and a plus. Followed by an optional space because we have space between this one and this one. And we have to define what's an optional space. Well, that's why space with at least one instance and it's optional. Again, a lot of uh, parcelet specific uh, DSL. Uh, at any network session, uh, I can explain, I can talk with you and explain how to use that for other examples. But for now, for now, let's just focus on the big picture. And at the end, we have to define what's a string. But a string in our programming language starts with a double code, has inside anything but double code, and, and ends with a double code. Yeah, so let's see whether this works. Let's try to run that. And we have a weird output, but that's not the goal of this step. Let's try to break our program on purpose. Let's try to remove our parentheses and try to execute it. We'll get an exception. And that is exactly our goal. We used parcelet gem and to define rules for what is a valid program in our small programming language and what is not. So we have the first step done. Next one is build an AST. So let's take a look at our code again. And similarly to the Ruby example that uh, I just showed at the beginning of, of our talk, we need to define how a tree for our programming language would look like. So let's try to do that. It would look something like this. It looks confusing at first, but the power of trees is that you can take any part of the tree and focus on it and split the problem in a very, very, very small step. So let's take the first line of code and do a tree for that. So we have an expression. It has two leaves. One, an identifier put. And second one, a string. So the tree for the first line of code is pretty simple, actually. So let's move to the next one. Again, at the top we have an expression, we have an identifier set, we have an, another identifier name, and inside we have another expression with one single leaf, get. That is the tree for second line of code. Let's move to the third one. And similarly, at the top we always have an expression. The first leaf is an identifier called put. The second leaf is another expression which has three leaves identifier plus, string hello, and identifier name. So that is our tree. It has three main sections for each line of code. So we have a rough understanding of how the tree for our program should look like. And so let's go. So at the beginning, you saw that Parslet just outputted something which looks like a tree, but a bunch of hashes and uh, keys and arrays, which is weird. So we'll use parcelet transforms. Again, uh, very parcelet specific stuff. 
You can study that, and I'll explain later if that's necessary. So Parslet allows to transform its output from these rules into something more uh, which looks like a tree. And so for that, we create a new instance of Parslet transfer gem, and we start defining rules. So first one is, we'll define a rule of how to build a leaf from a stream. And in here syntax is as following. When we define rules, we, we give names to each of the stuff matching inside our, our code. And we then in transform apply some uh, transformation to those rules. So this, this, the, the DSL for parcel transform is saying that we define a rule, anything that's a string, we'll just convert that to a simple value and create an instance of a string node. And a string node in our program is just a simple class that accepts a value and that's it. So, let's try to run that and see what we have. You see what happened is, instead of strings being weird hashes and arrays, we now have an object. Which is convenient because we're programming in an uh, object oriented, we're programming in Ruby and those objects will have, help us uh, simplify the implementation. And again, here we have another struct. Let's try to move forward. We define another rule, but this time for identifiers. We said that anything that looks as identifier should be returned as an identifier. And again, we pass that a simple value and just create an instance of an identifier node, which again, is just a simple class which accepts a value, it does nothing at the moment. And when we try to execute that, now, we have identifier nodes everywhere we had weird hashes and arrays before that. And the last part which we need to do, we need to transform expressions, but this one is a bit different in saying that instead of casting it to a simple value, we use the parsed subtree transform. And this basically said that there are, there are other nodes inside besides this one. And again, we'll cast to an expression node it's just a simple class which accepts nodes and just returns it. And let's try to execute that. Now, you see what we have here? This looks very similar to our tree. And if we go back here, we have expression node, which has nodes as an array, two children. Again, all that structure from our, from our graph, from our tree, is mirrored in our code. So that, that's good because we have the IST. Now, now that we have the IST, all we have to do is evaluate it. So this seems like a complicated problem, but actually because we have a tree, we can split it in very, very small parts. So, and to simplify our task, I'm gonna just remove all the lines except the first one. So we can just focus on just making the first line of our program work. And up until that, all I had to do with the AST is what was to print it. But I'm gonna do one simple change. I'm gonna call method eval on each of those three roots and see what happens. First thing we have is method eval is not present for expression node, which is fine because we did not define it, so let's do that. And we are not sure how this method should work, and all we're going to do is just print the nodes that, inside, that are inside it, because we don't know how to work with them yet. So this is what we get inside. I'm going to copy that. And put here. So we have as nodes one identifier node with value put and another string node with value please input your name. So we need at this point to decide how our programming language is going to implement the methods which programmer use in that programming language. So for the simplicity we can just call built-in Ruby methods with the same name. So every time a programmer in a programming language calls put We'll just call Ruby's implementation of put. So, actually, what we need to do here is call somehow kernel that puts. Please input your name. 
right? So how do we do that? Well, we have a bunch of simple, simple objects. We can use those to call the method. So we'll do kernel that sent to invoke a method dynamically, and we'll use the the first node as a method name because value is put, and we need to call kernel that put. And after that, we send to this uh, built-in Ruby method everything else. So that will be everything from the second node at the end, but we also call eval on that. Because again, each tree uh, node has to be evaluated. Let's try, and run, let's try to run that and see what happens. Now, we have another error. Private method eval called for string node. Well, we have to define how do we evaluate a string in our programming language. And for us, this is very simple because to evaluate the string, all we have to do is just return its value. Right? And our first line of code works. Again, we just focus on the first line. We get a tree. We said that anything that's inside an expression will just call Ruby built-in methods. In our case, this is put. And pass all the other links to those built-in methods as evaluated tree nodes. So let's focus on the second line. Let's add it. This one is a bit more interesting. But again, let's just execute and let's see what happens. We get a very weird error that method eval is called for an identifier node, but let's just see, let's just try to understand how to execute this program. We'll just bring the nodes inside this one so we can focus on the implementation. Let's try to copy that. And put here. So up until now, we called built-in Ruby uh, implementations for this method, but this one is special because Ruby doesn't know what set means, nor does Ruby understand the syntax for sending variables. So that means that we need to add special handling for that. So what we have to do is add a check. for this situation, and then otherwise called Ruby built-in program, built-in implementation. So what we need to do is, first of all, we need to answer the question how we store variables. For the purposes of this talk, we just can use a simple cache. And what would actually need to happen in this case, we need to somehow call bars of name equals the result of the execution of this one. So this is the equivalent Ruby code that we have to call in order to implement this syntax. So looking at again at our structure, we can get a rough idea how to implement that. So you can say the parts of nodes, the variable name is the second node. We get a variable name like that, we get string name, and then we need to assign the result of the execution which will be the last one, but we're just going to evolve that. And we don't know if we save the variable correctly, we'll just print that, pp parts. Let's try to run that and see what happens. Yay! So we have a way to save stuff to variables. Cool. Now, all we have to do is implement the last line of code. Again, let's run that and see what happens. I have an error saying that the, the implementation does not know what means eval for identifier node, and this actually happens here. So how do we resolve an identifier what we mean that we need a, ver a value of a variable? We go to the implementation of our identifier node, define the method eval, and in here we just return everything, anything that there's in bars cache. Uh, 
Não sei o que está. Oh, it's fresh. Uh, yeah, we have another error. Undefined method plus. See, here we always delegate to the kernel, but Ruby is an object-oriented uh, language, and addition is implemented in the stream itself. So again, we need to add handling for that. We'll just add special handling for plus, and in here what we actually need to do is to call, is to run the equivalent of this Ruby code, right? So we need to take, and in here the string is the second node, so we need to take the second node, a valid, call plus, and just, <coughs> Take the last node and evaluate the string hello and the identifier name. Let's try to run that. It doesn't work, okay, because I have a typo. Nodes, nodes, go again. Hello, Andre. Our program is implemented. So the idea is, the, the purpose of this talk is to illustrate that if you research a problem and split it in very, very small parts and use the data structure like trees uh, for, for your advantage, you can take the complex task of implementing a programming language and split it in very, very small parts. So right now, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. So guys, any questions? Uh, if instead of Lisp syntax you prefer to use like Ruby syntax, how would that complicate the rules? Um, okay, so first of all, <laughs> implementing a programming language in Ruby which looks the same as, the, as Ruby is a bit like pointless, but no, I, mean, I, like, I understand what you mean. With parts so, you can everything. Ruby uses a library uh, which is called yak for its syntax and there's a yak definition file for Ruby itself and if you try to open it, it has about... Uh, so the answer is a lot. Yeah, <laughs> it has about... Uh, yeah, a, a lot of line of codes, about 12,000 because Ruby is optimized for happiness but that has a cost. Yeah, because and, and list is the other way. Like list is basically a Polish notation. So yes, it's easy yes, it's yes. almost a ready AST already. So. Exactly, because the, the beauty of list is that it is defined defined in itself. The list program itself looks, looks like an abstract syntax tree, which makes the uh, the job of like, implementing the programming language like that very simple. Okay, thank you. And plus one for Ladakh, Liberty, and Bit. Yeah. Anyone else? Step, uh, any situation where you need to move forward in the last of syntax, let's say about one or two steps? Uh, in our implementation, it actually does not matter. So I'm going to show a simple example. In here, the implementation of the expression node has no assumption at which level of nesting it is present. So actually, we can get here deep for as much as we want. It will work because let me try. Let me try to do that. In here, we'll have another plus with dear a name. See, I added another level of nesting. But the power of trees is that it doesn't matter how. Uh, sorry about that. The power of trees is doesn't doesn't matter how deep you go. The implementation has no assumption about the depth where you are. So if I write Andre, hello dear Andre. And I, I can go as deep as I want, it will work. What if you would write a syntax like plus space equal? And plus space equal? Yes, in that way, it process the round. And in order to know which 
上。Uh, I get your point. Uh, I cheated by using list syntax, right? But if you take something that is more complicated with a lot of edge cases like Ruby syntax, as we, as we saw, the syntax definition itself is very big and the implementation itself is quite big. And I'm sure there are cases where you need to look at that. But for the purposes of, of, the, of this presentation, of the purposes of not confusing the, the people so much, we state that list. The idea is that I give you initial pointers of where to start, but there are, of course, there are edge cases. Yes? Hello. I have a question. Can we use another gems in that code? <coughs> Yes, of course. Uh, I chose to use Parslet, but there are a lot of PEG uh, gems for Ruby. Uh, for example, if you search this one, Ruby PEG, you can see that Parslet is the second result, but there, there are others. Each having its own uh, syntax, DSL, plus and minuses. So it's a research which you have to do in case you want to start implementing a programming language. way to do it you, you are right but then again you have one you have one problem now you have two you have besides trying to figure out how to implement the programming language you also have to figure out in which programming language to do that and we have a bigger problem so the idea is you can start with what you're familiar with understand the core principles and once you do that you can transfer that implementation to C for example and then yeah work in small steps Thank you. Thank you.